I'm Joe McCall, and uh, I have never done a Saturday event all day before, so I'm really excited about this. I've done lots of one night, Wednesday night things, and uh, I, what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight, I promise today, see, <laughs> I never, what I'm going to be sharing with you, nobody has taught before to you guys. I can almost promise that. Um, but, you know, not that I'm anything special. Um, I just really love this business. And uh, I'm going to be sharing with you some pretty amazing things that uh, I know work. Let me, uh, let me look something up real quick here. Marketing. Okay, hold on. Marketing. Michael, could I have a glass of water, please? Yes. Or like a, a bottle? Cold, please. Thank you. So we're going to take a lunch break at what time, Michael? Whenever you want. Noonish. Noonish? Yeah. When I start seeing heads nod, I'll. Yeah, that'll be Okay. <laughs> we ready? All right, hey, good. I am uh, so excited to be here. Uh, I've known Michael for a year or two now, but um, we met at Life in Air. A lot of you have uh, were here when Wendy Patton or Steve, uh, Steve Cook or Sean McCloskey were here. And uh, I'm part of the same program in Life in Air. I'm a big fan of it. And uh, I love the business of real estate because it has allowed me the freedom that I only could dream of a few years ago when I was sitting in seminars like this and it was always my dream to be one of those guys who had this checks that the speakers always talked about with one of the testimonials I'd wanted to work in this business for so long as an entrepreneur I tried every different strategy you could think of and uh, I kept on making tons of mistakes and those of you who are Wednesday I'll, I'll share my story a little bit again but I made about every mistake you could imagine I bought all the courses but here's the problem I was trying to be a jack of all trades, but I really became a master of none because I was trying so many things. I thought I knew better than the ones teaching the courses that I bought. I mean, that's pretty arrogant now that I'm thinking about it, looking back. But I thought, well, I don't like that postcard. I'm going to change it and I'm going to do this way. Or I don't like their website. I don't like what they say they, that you have to say to sellers, so I'm going to change it and do it my way. And I kept on struggling. and. and couple reasons why I struggled so much is because number one I just didn't trust them when they said to do what they said to do and number two I thought um, I, I was trying to do too many things I wasn't focused on just one or two strategies back when I was really buying a lot of properties um, back in 05 and 06 I bought about 15 or 16 homes in the span of a year which According to, I mean, comparing myself to Michael, it's not <laughs> very many. But for me, that was a lot, right? I read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. I was all excited about real estate, you know, and I thought the key to getting out of the rat race was just to buy a bunch of homes that cash flow a couple hundred a month, and you're set. Well, my goal was to own a couple hundred of those homes, and that would provide enough cash flow. But the thing is, on each house, even if you're doing lease options, on each house, when you have just $100 or $200 a month in cash flow, that always just quickly disappears as soon as you get a vacancy. You know, if you have 12 homes and you have one month of vacancy, that wipes out all of the cash flow you've had on those previous homes that you've been saving up. So I was not buying these properties right. I was counting on appreciation. 
um, and I was in debt over my head. I was getting tons of private lenders, um, and I was in a world of hurt. Then the market started falling. I had situations where the owners of these homes that I bought subject to, how many of you know what subject to means? So I was buying homes by taking over the existing mortgages, right? And I was putting tenant buyers in them to lease them out. Um, but the market was collapsing, everybody was panicking. I had the owners of the homes come knocking on the doors and saying to the tenant buyers, hey, when are you going to buy the home? The tenant buyers would say, well, who are you? And the seller would say, I own this home. And then they would say, I thought Joe owned this home. What are you talking about? And then, then the seller would say, well, you're supposed to buy this home. And the, guy would, the tenant buyer would say, well, I have another year left. That happened to two of my homes. And so then all of a sudden, the tenant buyer freaks out, calls their attorney. The seller freaks out, calls their attorney. I didn't do anything wrong. Okay. Then at the same time, my private lenders, because I put private lenders in second position. Do you know what that means? I had a little bit of equity, and so I was taught to get private lenders in second position. And I still had cushion for them, but that cushion disappeared. Now, my private lenders wanted their money back. I promised them I could give them their money back if they just give me 45-day advance notice. But I couldn't get a private lender to replace them. So the tenant buyers are saying, hey, what are you doing with subject twos? I, part of the problem was I didn't explain everything fully and fully disclose everything to the sellers and the tenant buyers. But now all of a sudden I got all these people freaking out, wanting their money back, wanting out of the deal. And uh, I was in a world of hurt and I was having serious cash flow problems. Serious cash flow problems. And uh, I started thinking about what I was doing wrong. And I realized I was trying to be a jack of all trades. I was trying to do all these different deals. I was, had all these courses and I was just taking out, I was cherry picking what I thought was good out of these courses and trying to combine them and make them my own. Okay. I don't know if any of you can relate. All right. A lot of you have bought a lot of courses, which is awesome. All right. The thing is, though, when you buy these courses, you just need to do what they say, and it works. I promise. There are some bad courses out there, but I'm telling you, most of the courses are really good. You just need to do what they say to do. So I realized I have a serious cash flow problem. And I opened up all these courses that I had, and most of them said that wholesaling is the foundation to the business, all right? But at me, I, I didn't think wholesaling was sexy enough. I didn't listen to them. I wanted to do the big deals. I wanted to do the big short sales, the big rehabs, the big wholesale flips where I make 10, 15 grand a pop. And um, I wanted to do the big, the big deals. Well, I realized I had a serious cash flow problem. Um, you can't eat equities, right? Um, so many of us at the back five, six years ago were buying properties based on appreciation, okay? not on the fundamentals of cash flow um, and being safe and not getting it over your head. So all of a sudden now I'm in a world of hurt, and you heard me tell the stories last, uh, last Wednesday of um, you know, not being able to sleep at night, comp just waking up in a cold sweat at four in the morning, not being able to go back to sleep because I was so stressed out on how I was going to pay the bills. My, I never missed a mortgage payment on our subject two houses, but um, I missed payments on our current house, so we had to do a short sale on our current home. And my wife didn't know until about um, a month or two before we got the um, foreclosure notice. So it's embarrassing to talk about that. But uh, I was making a lot of mistakes, and I was trying to hide it all, and I was trying to fix it all. Things are a lot better now. But I realized I needed to learn how to make cash flow. I needed to learn how to put money in my pocket to pay the bills, okay? Um, that equity that I thought I had disappeared. That little one or $200 a month I had in cash flow quickly disappeared. Um, and so I decided I, I got to figure this wholesaling thing out. So I got a couple old courses. I bought a couple new ones. You should see my shelf. I got tons of courses. Um, people ask me too, should I buy your lease option course or somebody else's and, and, and somebody else's? I say, buy them all, okay? But anyway, um, so I, I, uh, I started, I got to learn wholesaling. So I bought a new course, I dusted off some of my old courses, opened them up, and I said, you know what, I'm just going to do what these guys say. And I found out a lot of them say the same thing. I'm just going to do what they say, I'm not going to question it. I'm not going to try to figure out or worry about steps seven and eight before I start doing steps one and two. Number one was marketing, and number two was talking to sellers, right? So I thought, I, that's what I'm going to do. So I took the postcards I didn't like, and I sent them out, okay? 
I took the script that I didn't like and I just started using it and I started asking the questions, making the same offers the way these guys said to do it. And I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. It worked. It really worked. I mean, like, I'm thinking, wow, these guys know what they're talking about. Duh. I mean, some of you may maybe think, well, okay, Joe, wake up. But I didn't think that these guys really knew what they're talking about. Well, it turns out they did. I mean, I bought lots of courses. Well, um, so my first wholesale flip was from a lady who practically begged me to buy her house. She called me three or four times. I told her, no, I'm not interested. And uh, she, she said, just make an offer, please. I mean, looking back, it was totally God that kind of orchestrated that because um, I was fighting it. I was saying, no way. She said, just make an offer. It was an old three family that had expired the year before way out in the sticks. I live in St. Louis, by the way. So it was way out in the sticks. And I didn't have any buyers out there. I didn't know how to comp it because there's no other multifamilies in this little city, this little town. So I said, it, was, it had expired the year before for like 140 or something. So I said, you know what? Um, the numbers, I either offered 40 or 50. Um, I think I offered 50. I said, ma'am, I'll give you 50 for it. And uh, she said, okay. I about <laughs> fell over. I thought, no way. So I got out all my contracts from these courses. I wrote every contingency I could find, because each course has different contingencies, you know. So I had all these contingencies, and they all probably contradicted each other, you know, by the time I got them all out. But all these contingencies, I made sure her son was with her. We met at a YMCA, and she signed the contract. I took it to the, I, I put a sign in the yard, and I got an offer the next day for $15,000 more. I, for, I think I had it under contract for 50, and I sold it for 65. It was either 40 and 55, but... Um, I made $13,000 after all my closing costs for that deal that she begged me to buy. And that's when I realized, you know what, this stuff works. This stuff works. Why didn't I think, or why didn't I listen to them earlier when I started getting investing, started doing investing? I remember exactly the courses that I bought, the videos that I watched, them harping over and over and over again, you've got to learn wholesaling. You've got to learn wholesaling. It's the foundational, fundamental element of real estate investing. Now, you may still want to do short sales, you may still want to do rehabs, you may still want to buy home subject to, and, and by the way, subject to, I, I don't want to be knocking that strategy. If you do it right, if you do it right, it's a very powerful strategy to control property. But you know, if you, you want to focus on that and that and that, that's fine, but you've got to learn how to wholesale properties because that will put quick cash in your pocket. And it really does work. It's not just some hype that you hear these speakers come and talk about. It really does work. And I've had tons of these checks now coming in since I finally figured it out, and I finally really kind of believed in myself that I could do it. I believed in myself that I could do it, and I believed that the system really works. You heard the lies. People say, you can't flip properties. You can't buy properties at 55, 60 cents on the dollar. Have you heard that? Have you heard people tell you, you can't flip them, it's illegal to flip? Have you had attorneys tell you, you can't do that, it's illegal? Or you have to have a realtor's license to do that? Or nobody would give you that much equity in their house. Nobody would just walk away. Or you're taking advantage of them. Don't listen to them. Okay, there's nothing illegal about getting a property under contract at a discount. Or even what I'm going to be teaching you, which is easier, even if there is no discount, getting a property under contract and then wholesaling that to somebody else. Okay, you can do it. All right? Now, I really want you to believe that. You can do it. How many here have never wholesaled a property before? Don't be embarrassed. It's okay. Good. Well, if you guys, I'm telling you, if you just do what I talk about today, in the next two to four weeks, you should be able to flip a home. It's really, really easy. It's not that hard. I know it's a little intimidating maybe, but the reason why I love wholesaling lease options is I don't have to negotiate and beat down these sellers to pennies on the dollar, okay? I don't even have to meet the sellers. I don't even have to go into their homes and see the house. The sellers email me pictures. Here's my offer to sellers. What do you want for your house? Okay, I'll get it for you, okay? So it's just a matter of time, right? I don't care about the price. I don't care about what they want. I don't care if it's even over leveraged, all right? If they're willing to lease their property for a period of time and then sell it, I get it under a lease option contract for three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, it doesn't matter, all right, then I sell that contract to a tenant buyer. So I started wholesaling a bunch of properties, um, but I was spending a ton of money on direct mail. 
I finally found the key. I finally figured it out. You know what? It's all about marketing. Okay? So, you remember, I, and I said this Wednesday night. You're not in the real estate business. You're in the marketing business. Okay? It doesn't matter that it's real estate. What matters is leads, sales, deals, marketing. It's all about marketing. You've got to learn how to get your phone to ring. Okay? And I'm going to be talking a lot about that today. How to get your phone to ring, how to get sellers to call you um, without spending hardly any money on marketing. So I started, I was wholesaling, um, I was doing what these guys were saying to do, and I was making all right money. I was making good money. But I was spending about three to thousand dollars a month on direct mail, and I was making about fifteen thousand dollars for every three thousand I was spending. That's not bad, okay? But it came to a point where I got so many leads coming in, I got frustrated that I was throwing so many away that didn't have any equity, um, or sellers that if they did have equity, they weren't willing to give any of it to me. Go figure. And uh, they, I, I, you know, when you're doing traditional wholesaling, you have to go and meet the sellers in their home most of the time uh, because you need to build some rapport. You need to go look at the house and look at the repairs. And you know how it goes. You, you ask the questions, is that the best you can do? If I can get you cash in seven days, can you go any lower? You know, if I brought a suitcase, so if a seller says, I want 60 for it, I always say, well, if I brought a suitcase full of uh, cash of $50,000 tonight, if I brought it over, if I brought a suitcase of cash of $50,000, you are telling me you wouldn't take it? A lot of times sellers will say, oh, okay, maybe. So, <laughs> so you know, there's, there's, I still do a lot of traditional wholesaling in my marketing, but at the time, rewind about four years, I was spending a lot of money on postcards and I was getting a lot of calls, but I didn't have the time because I had a full-time job. I didn't have the time to schedule appointments to go meet them in their house. Um, so I was getting frustrated. I was throwing these leads away left and right. And nobody could sell their house, not nobody. Tons of people couldn't sell their house and there were also a lot of buyers that couldn't buy a house. So this is kind of an, my evolutionary journey into wholesaling lease options. Um, I started thinking, you know, um, and this is all, by the way, at the same time when I'm completely stressed out and freaking out about how to pay the bills and we were getting our utilities shut off. Um, my wife was taking the kids through McDonald's and the card, not the de credit card, but the debit card was getting declined. Our credit cards were maxed out. She couldn't even buy our kids a $3 Happy Meal at McDonald's. She was in Target, you know, putting all the stuff on there, people behind her and the card gets declined and she has to walk away completely humiliated and embarrassed because the card was declined. Um, you know, I'm not going to ask who knows what I'm talking about, but I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate. I was a schmuck, basically. I was robbing Peter to pay Paul. I was not a good manager of our finances because I had a serious cash flow problem. I didn't understand how to manage my cash. And um, I was counting on all these big deals to sell, and they never did. Anyway, so I, I, I loved... Wholesaling, I knew it worked, but I had to spend a lot of money to get deals. Um, at the same time, I loved lease options because one of the first books I read um, was a, a book by Robert Sheeman called The Secrets of a Millionaire Landlord. It's a real good book. And in there, he had a chapter about whole, uh, lease options. And he talked about how you can take your properties and um, make the tenants responsible for the maintenance and repairs. And that blew my mind. I thought, wow, that's amazing. You could really do that. And then I read Wendy Patton's book on lease options, and I realized you can, the powerful thing about lease options is you can control property without owning it, okay? This was at a time in my life I was losing houses, houses to short sales, foreclosures, and uh, I did not, another deed was the last thing I wanted. Another deed, I did not want to own any more mortgages. I wanted to get completely out of debt, okay? And um, so... I realized the power of lease options because you can control property without owning it. That's really, really important. I love options because they take away most of all of the risk involved with investing. If the deal goes bad, you just tell the seller, I'm sorry, I'm not going to exercise my option. Okay. So uh, I asked myself, why can't I wholesale lease options? So I started advertising for friends at the local RIA groups and stuff like that. I said, hey, I'll find tenant buyers for you if you pay me 500 bucks. I started getting a lot of people say, yeah, sure. So I started advertising. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was collecting about $500 each time I did it. And I realized that's a lot of work for just 500 bucks. So I had a virtual assistant at the time in Indiana, 
and she's doing this marketing stuff for me, and she says, you know, I have another guy I'm working for down who does a bunch of deals in Georgia who makes a lot more money than you do doing these deals. And I thought, wow, thanks. She <laughs> said, well, you should call him. I said, okay, I will. Um, so he's flipping four or five or six of these lease options a month in Atlanta, Georgia, from his beach condo in Florida. I was talking to him on the phone. I could hear the waves on the ocean. And he's flipping these things, and he's keeping the entire option deposit. Come to find out, he's making just as much money as I am per deal, flipping lease options, as I am doing traditional wholesaling with a lot less effort and virtually from his beach condo in Florida. This guy's still doing the business. Um, he travels, he, um, all, he travels, it's kind of weird, his, his wife homeschools his kids and they travel, they stay, only, they stay in one place every two to three months. They, they, they go to vrbo.com and find a new house to rent for a couple months and they just keep on moving all over the country. The guy's weird, eccentric. <laughs> but um, anyway, so he loves that lifestyle, right? So good for him. But he's flipping properties all over the country now in his market in Atlanta and other markets around the country. So I said, I can do this too. So um, I started calling sellers up in Craigslist and saying, hey, I saw your property on Craigslist. Would you ever consider selling it on a lease option or a rent to own? And sellers started saying, sure. And I said, okay, well, um, let me send you a contract. Remember, I was working full-time job. And you know how it is. I was working in my cubic hill. And I got so good because, I mean, I was trying to do real estate, you know. I, I was freaking out because I was working my 50, 60 hour a week job. I was an engineer working as a scheduler in a power plant for an electrical contractor. Go figure. So I got to a point where you could hear the footsteps coming down the hall, you know. And you could do, if, if on, your keypad, on your keyboard, if you do Alt-Tab, it switches the screens, you know. So I'd have the MLS open. I'd be going through Craigslist. I'd be doing all my real estate stuff. And I'd hear the footsteps and I'd Alt-Tab to come to my other screen so it looks like I was working. It was so bad. And I got great performance reviews, you know. I did my job, but I always went home guilty. I felt just this tremendous burden of guilt because I wasn't giving my employer 100%, you know. I was just doing the bare minimum. Um, I was getting good at performance reviews. I got the great 3% raise every year, you know, just to keep up with inflation. But I was getting so frustrated because no matter how hard I worked on my job, I always got paid the same. No matter how much profit I brought to the bottom line, I just got paid the same every year. I got, if I was lucky, I got a 3% raise to keep up with inflation, you know. So I got real good at I'd walk, I'd say, hey, I'm going to walk the job site, you know. And I'd pretend to be doing business on my phone, but I'd really be talking to my realtors and these guys that were help working for me and doing deals. And um, Finally, my, the, my friends started knowing what I was doing, and they were giving me a hard time. And I was getting nervous because I thought, man, once my boss finds out, I'm going to be in trouble, you know. And so, but then I'd come home, and I would I have to spend time with my family, but I was still trying to do work. And um, I just hadn't, the only time I could talk to sellers was when I was driving home from work and during my lunch break. Um, and when I was walking the job. So, um, so it, got really, it got really bad. And then, um, so I started flipping these lease options. And I realized, you know what? I don't have to go see the house. I don't have to show the house. Um, so the way I set it up is I had, all, I had these virtual assistants. I was, I was forced to find virtual assistants and local realtors to do all the work for me because I couldn't. So I started just talking to sellers on the phone asking them a few questions, emailing them my contract. They would sign it, email it back to me. My contract is non-binding, which means they can still advertise it on their own. If they lease it or sell it before I do, they can cancel my agreement. So I'm not really, they're not really losing anything. And so there's really um, no reason why they would say no. I'm just marketing the home and it's expanding it to more buyers. So anyway, the sellers, I start telling them, just send me pictures. Okay, so the seller started sending me pictures. I didn't have to go to the house to take pictures. I didn't have to negotiate anything. I didn't have to beat them down in price. I just found out what they wanted for the house, and then I marked it up a little bit, and I'll be walking through those steps here in a minute. Um, and then um, once, I started, once I got the house under contract, I started having my VAs advertise it on Craigslist and a bunch of different sites. And then I started having the sellers, I figured out the sellers could show the homes for me. 
Because they're already advertising the house, right? They need to meet the tenant buyers anyway. So I just, you know, I just, you have not many times because you ask not, right? And so I didn't believe that you could actually keep the entire option deposit. But I, I didn't think you could because I never asked for it. And then when I started asking for it, the seller said, okay, sure. Some of them still object, but, you know, I'd kind of throw those deals away then. So I had all of these misconceptions in my mind that this really couldn't be done. Then I started talking to people who were doing it. And they were telling me, yeah, you can keep the entire option deposit. Yeah, you don't have to show the home. Okay, so now I'm getting these properties under contract. My VAs are advertising the homes, and the sellers are actually showing the homes for me. And the way I have the paperwork set up, the seller can't go around behind my back because they don't have the rest of my lease option paperwork. Okay? And I'm the one who has the mortgage broker and the credit repair company and the ways to check the credit reports, I mean, the, to pull the applications and pull the credit reports and do the background checks. So anyway, all of a sudden I start flipping lease options. And within three to four months, my part-time income flipping these lease options surpassed my full-time income at my job. Okay? And I said, see ya. I gave them my two weeks. Um, they said, you know, Joe, you've done a great job. If it doesn't work out, you're free, more than welcome to come back. And I kind of <laughs> laughed. I said, if you guys only knew what I was doing while I was working for you. I still feel kind of bad to this day, honestly, because I, mean, I, don't, I don't encourage that. To, if, you guys are, if you guys are working a full-time job and your employer is paying you, you, know, you need to work 100% for your employer. Um, so, or just maybe get a little creative on how you can do it. Here's what I did. What's funny, um, I couldn't even talk to sellers, so I, I hired a friend to talk to sellers for me. I said, hey, why don't you talk to these sellers, and if you get under contract, I'll give you 25% of whatever the deal is. So I was just outsourcing everything, and I realized, wow, this stuff really works. Later on, about two years ago, after I'm already been working this full time, I, my wife is having a baby, and uh, uh, it's, we've adopted all four kids. It's a long story, but the fourth one, uh, we adopted that little baby as an embryo. Okay. It's kind of weird, but it, you know, she was an embryo. She was frozen for four years. The family that did the IVF um, couldn't have any more. They couldn't get pregnant again, so they gave the embryos up for adoption, and we adopted it. So, and they FedExed overnight, 24-hour <laughs> overnight, on the certain day, you know, this frozen embryo and we go to the doctor and we leave an hour and a half later and she's pregnant. This is Man, you're outsourcing everything, aren't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm outsourcing everything. That's so That's so funny. I can't wait to tell my wife that. <laughs> So, uh, class <laughs> oh boy. So while she was, you know, while she was pregnant, I'm, I'm helping out with the kids, you know, and, um, and so my VAs are getting all, I tell my VAs, look, I can't talk to these sellers because I was doing some more talking to them. And I said, just talk to them. And if they're interested in lease option, then set up an appointment on my calendar for me to call them back. So all of a sudden now, every day I have about five, six, seven appointments to call sellers back, which is great, but I'm so busy, I'm like, oh, I can't handle this. So I told the VAs, one of the main guys I was working with at the time, I said, hey, you know, I can't talk to them all. I'm, I'm not even keeping these appointments. Why don't you call them and just sell them for me? I mean, tell them about lease purchasing, how it works, send them the contract and follow up and all of that. So all of a sudden he says, okay, great, I'll do that. And all of a sudden I'm getting three, four contracts a week for my VAs who's doing this stuff for me. And I realized, oh man, I don't even have to talk to the sellers anymore. <laughs> I, can have, I can train VAs to do it for me. Um, and this guy's still working for me. He's one of my business partners now. Um, so we're expanding out in other markets. He's from the Philippines, but he lives in California. And his name is Gil. Um, so now he's got a bunch of friends and he's brought them on our team to do marketing for us from the Philippines. So it's, it's amazing. So now um, they're getting contracts they're getting properties under contract for me. Now all I'm doing is sending that contract to my local realtor who advertises and markets the home, finds the buyer, and all I do is sign the check. Okay? We do about two to four deals a month like this in St. Louis. We're doing other deals around the country. 
And uh, I literally don't spend any more than five hours a week on my wholesaling lease options business in St. Louis. Um, the rest of the time I spend teaching and coaching, which I really love doing. I enjoy teaching and coaching actually more than I do doing deals, but I'm still doing deals because I want to make sure I understand what's going on in the market. Um, the market changes, you know, all the time. And um, the cool thing now is I'm doing a lot more deals all around the country with other students. And kind of the more my name gets known as one of the lease option guys out there, I'm getting sellers from other parts of, I just got a, a, a contract from a seller in Ohio. I have no idea how they found my website as St. Louis Rent to Own Homes, you know. But somehow they found me and they uh, sent me a contract. And uh, I have uh, a house under contract in Ohio now. And so I'm going to actually call the seller up um, later today, hopefully, and, uh, and talk to them about consulting. One of the things I love about this business is you can sell your noggin, brain power, knowledge, as a consultant to sellers. Sometimes you'll get sellers that call you in areas that you don't, aren't interested in investing in, or you're too busy with other things. But you know how to do lease purchasing. You know how the paperwork works. You know how to market the homes. You know how to do background checks on the tenant buyers. You know the best websites to advertise on. So a lot of sellers out there, when you tell them, hey, I'll do this for you, but I'm going to keep the entire option deposit. I don't even ask anymore if that's okay with them. I just say, this is the way I do it. And if you have a problem with that, that's fine. It's no big deal. It's okay to say no. I play the reluctant buyer. I'm not pushing anything on them. I'm pulling them in. Okay, and we'll talk more about that as we go on today. So, um, um, what was I just saying? Um, consulting, thank you. So consulting now, what I've been doing lately, and I love it because the sellers will say, I, I tell them, look, I'm gonna, I can do it for you and I'm going to keep the entire option deposit. Or I can teach you how to do it and you can keep the entire option deposit. I'll just keep one month's rent. You have to pay me up front for, but I'll keep one month's rent as a consulting fee. All right? Really powerful strategy because now my dollar per hour of work on a deal dramatically increases. Because now all I'm doing, the seller pays me one month's rent up front. I can teach them how to do a lease option on their house. I give them my paperwork. Since I'm a consultant, I'm not signing anything for them. I'm not filling out any of the blanks. Okay? But I'll send them the paperwork. I'll tell them which websites to advertise on. And I'll tell them, by the way, when you get a tenant buyer, I know this company that you can go to to get their credit checked. I know this title company that you can go to that will pull all of the paperwork and make sure everything's signed. Um, I have this uh, mortgage broker that you can put the tenant buyer with. I can teach you how to pull a background check on the tenant buyer. And I, my contracts are very pro-landlord friendly. So now, all of a sudden, I'm selling my services as a consultant. And I may really only get 1000 or 1500 bucks as a consultant, but I'm not spending like any more than one or two hours max. And I'm telling the seller, if you have any questions, call me. So they'll call me once in a while if they have questions, or what do I do? This guy has a question about this. So I love the consulting business because I can now can offer my services as a consultant to sellers anywhere around the country. And if you really take a hold of this, okay, you can start advertising on a national scale. You can advertise yourself as a lease purchase expert. Okay? I start advertising your services as a lease purchase expert to sellers. Okay? And then they can start hiring you as a consultant to teach them how to do lease purchasing. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Any of you get excited about that? Now, it's not the big $5,000, $10,000 deals. I understand that. Okay? But it's a lot less work. Just a couple phone calls, a couple emails. All right? And once you've got your system set up, like I do, I already have that stuff with the training videos and everything that I can just send to the seller. Here you go. This is what you do. So uh, I'm excited. I love this business because you can do it virtually from anywhere in the world. Okay? Are you questions now or do to I'll take questions as we go as long as it doesn't get over out of control. And remind me, please, since I'm recording this, to repeat the question. Okay? The question was, if I'm doing this as a consultant, am I worried about other states' laws? Um, the only state I'm worried about is Texas. Um, and Texas, even then, 
uh, you can still do lease options in Texas. A lot of people think lease options are illegal. They're not. In fact, I just got an email yesterday from the guy who runs the big RIA in Dallas, one of them, and he's teaching a class on how to do lease options in Texas. Um, I have friends who've been doing lease options for seven, eight years in Texas. Uh, their paperwork's just a little different. So uh, I, if it was a beginning student learning to do the consulting thing, I would tell them maybe just stay away for Texas from, from Texas for now. But in every other state, there's nothing illegal about doing a lease and a contract to sell that house in one or two years down the road. Lease options are not illegal in any state of the union. So when it comes to the paperwork, what I'll do is I'll send them my paperwork, which I know is very standard and should work in most all of the states. But I'll tell the sellers, look, you can use this if you want. You should get an attorney to review it. What I'd recommend is either get an attorney to review this paperwork or, or um, an, uh, call some local realtors and ask them to help you advertise the house for lease, okay, um, and then use their lease contract. Or if you have a friend who's a realtor or a property management company, use the lease that those companies use in that city because a lot of times those leases have already been prepared by attorneys in that area and are familiar with the local customs. Or I'll say just go to LegalZoom.com and you can get state-specific contracts. So I'll give them mine, but I'll tell them other options, okay? I'll always recommend that they review and have an attorney review it, and I'll recommend something like prepaid legal to them, okay? But um, I, if it was, I, I feel totally confident using my contracts in all 50 states, and I, and I would. It's not, it's really not that, I don't want to say it's not a big deal, but it kind of isn't. If it's just one deal, um, so, I do encourage this, but the cool thing about a website like LegalZoom is they have specific contracts that are been reviewed by attorneys in all 50 states, okay? Um, in fact, I don't know how much it costs to get a lease. The main document that you need to be concerned about is the lease, because that's where most of the laws in any municipality or county um, affect is the lease. Um, so it's not a big deal. Just use the local lease that the people there in that city use and then use an option contract. The option contract is really simple. And there's really, I've never seen a state that has specific laws about how an option contract can be written. Okay? But anyway, the great thing about this business is you can do it virtually from anywhere in the world. I'm doing deals virtually in St. Louis right now. I honestly cannot remember the last time I went to go see a house and meet a seller. Um, you know what I, I do remember? It was a couple years ago, and the seller, I was doing more traditional wholesaling on this particular time, um, and the seller told me they had a lot of equity, they were motivated, um, but I didn't ask them on the phone how much they wanted for their house. I just thought I'd go there, build some rapport, and make an offer, because um, I knew they had a lot of equity, and I knew they were motivated. Well, it turns out we were worlds apart, and I just wasted two hours of my day. I was so frustrated. So I, I've been on a journey to learn how to talk to sellers and get the deals closed on the phone because it can be done. So um, you can do virtually, and that's one of the main things we're going to be talking about today is how to flip lease options virtually. A lot of you, how, you all live in Colorado, Colorado Springs? Who doesn't live in Colorado Springs? About maybe a third of the room. Um, even if you do live here and you may be worried about all the competition, the people, other people doing these deals in Colorado Springs. Well, number one, forget about that. Don't be worried about competitions. There's plenty of sellers, even here in Colorado Springs, that need to sell their house but can't, and tons of buyers that want to buy a house but can't. All right? And number two, you can literally do these deals anywhere in the country. So if you wanted to focus on Denver, what's another big city in Colorado? Fort Collins? Pueblo? You know? So you could, you could focus on these deals anywhere. You could even start going into Kansas. Um, what's on the other side? Wyoming. Utah, Wyoming, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> you can go up to Salt Lake City maybe, but it doesn't matter. You know, you could uh, focus on California because the rents are much higher, the prices are higher there, and you can make more option deposit money there. So you're not limited by where you live. Just want to help you get that and understand that. It's a great thing about this business. So um, can you all see the screen okay? Can you really travel all around the world with your family flipping properties with only a laptop? 
Yes. Those of you Wednesday night, I talked about our trip to Prague just a few months ago. We got back, well, we got back May 25th. Uh, we, I took my, my wife and four kids to the Czech Republic. And we lived in Prague for two months. And uh, I literally only worked about one or two hours a day at a local coffee shop. Um, and we did a lot of traveling. We did a lot of, we, every day we went out and did touristy things. We were real close. I mean, this is the Charles Bridge right there, and that's Prague Castle. And we lived right over here, um, real close to the river. It's just a gorgeous city. If you ever get a chance to go to Europe, you've got to go to Prague. Um, it's just a beautiful city. It was never bombed during World War II, so a lot of the buildings are still there from the 1300s. You know, it's amazing. And um, uh, this is us in London. We had a blast. Um, a lot of people, it's funny, the looks that you get <laughs> when you're uh, traveling with four kids at these big international airports. And, um, but our kids were just fantastic. Um, they did really good. And my wife, it's really mostly owed due to my wife. Um, that we went to Ireland, had a blast in Ireland. And um, this is uh, uh, one of my sons. We lived in this old converted barn. It was an old barn from the 1500s that uh, they rest, restored and turned into a um, little two-bedroom cottage. And uh, we stayed there. We had a blast at the beach. That's my... My one-year-old, a lot of sheep. <laughs> and here is us this last year at Estes Park. And I love this picture because we spent a week in Breckenridge with some family. And uh, at the last minute, we just decided, let's go to Estes Park for a week. And it dawned, I'd, been, I'd left my job two or three years earlier, and it dawned on me for the first time, wow, I don't have to ask my boss for any time off. I don't have to worry about personal days, you know. And so my business, when we're traveling like this, just hums on along without me. While we were in Prague, I still flipped two properties in St. Louis. Okay? I talked to sellers a little bit, but it was mostly my virtual assistants that were doing most of the work. Um, I was able to, and I'm going to talk about this as we go through here, how I do this, how I actually flip properties, how I find virtual assistants, the technology and the resources that I use. So we still flipped several deals even while we were in Colorado. Um, we're going to Costa Rica or Panama next spring for a couple months. Um, my wife homeschools our kids, so why not? We can travel anywhere we want around the world. I don't want to wait till I'm 65 before I travel the world. I love my grandparents. God bless them. I had dinner with them last night. They live in Littleton here. And um, I love them to death. But it kind of breaks my heart. My grandpa always talks about the woulda, coulda, shouldas in his life. He'll ask me, he says, Joe, what's your, what are some of your biggest woulda, coulda, shouldas? I say, Grandpa, I'm only in my mid-30s. I don't have any yet. But, you know, he starts telling me about all of his woulda, coulda, shouldas. He was a U.S. Merchant Marine, served in World War II. Um, just an awesome guy. I, I, they've been married 66 years. And they're still sharp as a tack. They're um, almost 90 years old. And uh, um, I took them to Outback Steakhouse last night. I just love sitting with my grandparents and talking to them and hearing their stories. Um, my grandpa, he, <laughs> he's kind of losing it a little bit, though. He, he, he started telling me that I'm his... Or he's my uncle. <laughs> I said, and, and my grandma s dropped her fork and looked at him and said, Stu, you're his grandpa. And he says, and he goes, oh, geez, you're right. He said, that's what old age does for you, Joe. So he realizes that he's making <laughs> these mistakes. But um, so anyway, just the nicest guy, but he talks about his woulda, coulda, shouldas. And uh, he talks about how growing up, how he wished he would have um, stayed um, taking these other jobs, taking these risks, um, not taking these certain investments. And I look at that and I, I, I really feel for him because he's sad about a lot of things. And I don't, I don't want to live like that. I believe my best days are still ahead. And I want to travel the world now with my family, with my kids. I want the freedom that retirement gives you now. Not when I'm, I, I've heard so many stories of guys who work hard all their life and the day or after they retire, something tragic happens and they pass away or whatnot. Um, I've heard story after story like that again. And so I'd rather live life today, travel the world with my family now, let my kids see the world, um, and, and be able to share that joy with them. Um, now, I'm not putting down anything my grandma and grandpa did. They were great parents to my dad and, and his brother and sister. 
Um, they did awesome things, and, and I really look up to them a lot. But it's just this, him talking about the woulda, coulda, shouldas in his life. I don't want to have any of those. I, don't want, to, I want to live life without regrets. Um, so this is just, this is us a couple weeks ago, my two girls in Oceanside. We went there and um, uh, stayed at a condo right on the beach. And um, we get to travel a lot. And we're talking about actually about coming back to Colorado after New Year's to go skiing. Um, but here's the cool thing. We can travel anywhere we want in the world and still run my business. All I need is a laptop. I don't even need a phone anymore because I can use the internet phone. I can use Skype. and I just need some headphones, right? All I need is a laptop. And I can do this business from anywhere in the world. So it's exciting. I'm not saying that to brag, except that I just want to maybe give you a little hope that you can do this. And those of you last Wednesday night, you saw this. This is my... Last day at work, um, my secretary, the secretary made these cupcakes, and guess which one's me? <laughs> All right, so I really believe there's no easier and faster way to make big chunks of cash than wholesaling lease options. I've kind of given you a, uh, an introduction to my story, why I'm so excited about this, this business. Um, I'm excited about it for various reasons. It's easy. I can do it virtually from anywhere in the world. I don't spend hardly any money in marketing. Um, I'm going to show you how you can get all the sellers you need for free on the internet. And um, there's really no limit. If you don't want to do a deal, you can offer your services as a consultant. Okay? All right. We reviewed last Wednesday the steps to wholesaling lease options, and I'm going to review those with you now. And uh, I'm going to be talking about how the paperwork works. Okay? So number one... It's real simple. You find it, flip it, and forget it. Find a property. There's lots of them out there. There's over 10 million homes. There's over 10 million sellers who would love to sell their house but can't. They're not behind on their payments. But they can't sell their house because they would have to bring money to the table to close. They can't drop their price low enough. And they don't understand what lease options are. Maybe they've heard about it, but they don't know how to do it. And I can guarantee you they're realtors are not offering lease options to them. Most realtors aren't. Who here is a realtor? Nice. Good. Okay. By the way, see those hands that are raised? Realtors? <laughs> those of you looking to partner with guys on deals, if you got some deals and you want to partner with some realtors, there they are. Okay. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot about realtors. I'm working on getting my license right now. I don't have it yet. It's been taking me two years to get it. <laughs> but I do have, uh, I have a deadline now that I've given myself. I have to get it done in October. So. Um, so working with realtors are really, really important. And there's a lot of realtors out there who are investor friendly. They understand creative real estate. They understand that, um, how lease options work. And you can partner with them on deals. Okay? So anyway, find it, flip it, and forget it. There's 10 million sellers who want to sell their house but can't. There's over 80 million sell buyers who want to buy a house but can't. It doesn't matter if the market's going up or down. Okay? There's always going to be more buyers wanting to buy a house but can't than there are sellers who can sell. But there's still a ton of sellers out there. So, number one, find it. It's real simple. You find a seller who can't sell their house. Many times they're advertising their house on Craigslist. All right? Many times these are sellers who have had their house on the MLS for over six months, a year. The reason why I say realtors aren't offering lease options to sellers is because they don't get their commissions up front, all of it. You know, they get their commissions, they maybe get one month's rent, but they really don't get the rest of their commissions until after it closes. But here's something I'm going to tell you about. You remember me telling you about Will uh, last Wednesday night, the guy who was sitting on his couch, couldn't rub two pennies together, and didn't know how he was going to feed his kids? When they came home from school, he looked at his couch and said, you know what, I can sell this on Craigslist. He sold it for 80 bucks, went to the grocery store. He sold it, like he put it on Craigslist, he sold it a couple hours later, took the money, went to the grocery store to buy food for his kids when they got home. That's how desperate this guy was. He heard one of my webinars and uh, started flipping lease options. And I had a couple of his checks that I showed you, over $18,000 he made in one month just recently. So guess what, though? He is a realtor. He works for Remax. And he's doing lease options exclusively. 
and he is collecting the full 3% up front as his commission. He's just using the standard listing agreement, then he's using the realtor's lease and the realtor's sales contract, and he does add a one-page addendum to clarify more of the specific lease option things. And he's putting in the listing agreement that he gets 3% up front. There's no, I mean, many realtors don't realize they can do that. There's no law that I know of in Colorado that says you can only get one month's rent commission on a lease option. So if you're a realtor, you can flip these as a realtor, or you can flip them as an investor like I do. Okay? Many times it's easier if you're a realtor to do this. Um, so he's flipping these deals left and right as a realtor. He's using standard listing agreements. Um, and then the other cool thing that he does now is if he has buyers that come to his website and he doesn't have a house for them, he can send them to MLS listed properties. Okay? And then once he finds a house that the seller is willing to do a lease purchase, he renegotiates the commission agreement with that realtor. There's nothing that says you can't renegotiate a commission agreement, right? That realtor then will go back to their seller and say, hey, if you want to do a lease purchase, we need to renegotiate a new commission agreement. So they do that with the seller. And he usually, when, he's, when he brings in another realtor, he usually gets half of the first 3%. So he gets 1.5%. But he sets it up where he gets the rest of his 3% when the house, if and when the house closes a couple years down the road. So many times if you're an agent, you get the front end 3% and the back end 3% if you do a lease option, okay? So you don't have to do, you don't have to be a realtor to flip lease options. But I recommend that you if you either get your license, um, find a partner who is licensed, marry a realtor, as I joked before, <laughs> or have your spouse get a license, or partner with an agent to help you advertise and market your homes. Um, okay, you got to outsource the selling part of the business anyway, right? You don't want to be taking calls. You don't want to be driving around town. So go ahead and outs just outsource it to a realtor. What I do, and I'm going to be talking about this later, so I won't get ahead of myself. I'm going to be talking later about how to find a realtor. Um, and what to s I put a Craigslist advertisement, so I'm going to talk about what to say. So you find a seller who can't sell their house. How many of you know it's not that hard to find a seller who can't sell their house? Just a few of you. Let me ask it again. How many of you know it's not hard to find a seller who can't sell their house? <laughs> Some of you guys still don't believe me. Well, um, yeah, they're easy to find. When you find one, and I'm going to be talking about later how to, what to say to the sellers, you're going to sign an option agreement with that seller. Okay? I use a flex option where the seller has the flexibility if they sell it or lease it before I do, then they can just cancel my agreement. Okay? I only get paid if and when I find a tenant buyer. Now, it's important to understand options. I'm a principal in the transaction. I enter into this agreement as the tenant buyer. Okay? I am the tenant buyer in this agreement. Then I can... Um, are you turning it down or up? If, okay. If it gets a little warm, would you mind turning it down? Okay. We'll see how it goes. Um, I don't, want to get, I don't want people to get sleepy. We'll take a break here in about half hour. Is that okay? All right, so um, you're, you're a principal in this transaction as a lease option. I'm entering into this agreement with the seller as a tenant buyer, and I have the right in my contract to sublease it out or assign it to somebody else. Okay? I fully disclose everything up front with the seller. So... As a principal, I can sell that contract to somebody else. I can sublease it. So if the numbers work and if there's a lot of equity, if there's a good cash flow spread, I'll stay in the middle and just sublease it out. So I'll do what's called a sandwich lease option. So I'll be the meat in the middle of the... So I have a lease option with the seller and another lease option with the tenant buyer, and I stay in the middle. I collect the rent and I pay the seller the rent. That's a sandwich lease option. Then there's wholesaling of lease options where I'm going to enter in as a tenant buyer, and if I find another tenant buyer, I will assign my contract to them and I'll step out, and then it'll be a contract between the tenant buyer and the seller. Okay? The seller will collect the rent. The seller accepts all liability and responsibility. The buyer knows exactly what's going on. I don't hide anything. The buyer knows that I'm keeping that option deposit money, but they know they still get it back as part of their future down payment, so they don't care. Okay? The seller knows what's going on. 
the seller understands all of the risks associated with lease purchasing property. On the first document that they sign, I tell them all of the risks. So the seller knows what's going on. They, they, they accept this seller, this tenant buyer, and the contract moves on. I mean, the con they, they, they sign the contract. I even have the seller sign an authorization to assign the contract. Even though they, I, they don't need to do that, it's just a second clear delineation. They understand what's, what's going on. So I sign an option agreement with me as the tenant buyer, and then I assign that contract. That's all it is. So the beautiful thing now, when I was doing traditional wholesaling, I had to find these big fat discounts. I had to buy these properties at huge discounts. Now all I do is I go to the seller and I say, what do you want for your house? And they tell me what they need to walk away with. I don't even have to look at comps anymore. I don't go look on Zillow or MLS, try to find out what current homes are selling for. I do that later. I'll explain why in a minute. It doesn't matter to me. I just find out, is that the bottom line number you have to walk away with? They say, yeah. All right, all right. So I tell them, we're going to bump it up a little bit to cover my fee and to cover rent credits. All right. And so I send them an email explaining them how the numbers work. If they say, yeah, that's good, let's go. I send them the contract, they sign it. Okay. So it's only at that time, after I send them the contract, I look at the comps. And I say, well, okay, they say they want 150 for it. I'm going to bump it up to 160 because I'm going to keep five and give the tenant buyer five for rent credits. So I'm going to bump it up to 160. Now at 160, how long do they need? How long does that tenant buyer need? Let's say the house, I think it's only worth 130. What, what do you do then? Two years, three years. Well, I extend it out to maybe three, five years. What if the house is upside down by 50, 75, $100,000? <laughs> Make it 10 years, 15 years. All right, if it goes out that long, I set it up where the option price will be whatever the loan balance is in 10 years. Okay, and I fully disclose to the tenant buyer that the house is over leveraged, okay, but you get to buy it any time between now and in 10 years at whatever the loan balance is. And you can show them an amortization schedule. It may be like this, but over time it goes like this, right? Even if you're really conservative and you don't figure on much appreciation, you pay down that principal every year, okay? So it's just a matter of time. Then I go back to the seller when they tell me what they want, I tell them what I'm going to advertise it for, and I tell them, hey, I'm going to be assigning this, I'm going to be keeping this. You get this, I keep this, if I assign it. And then I'm going to say, look, if you want to walk away with 150, that's going to probably take one, two, three, five years. Are you okay with that? I've never really had a seller say no, because I remind them of their options. Okay, once they've agreed to do a lease purchase, they know that they need too much for their house. Right? So, but the great thing, I don't have to beat them down in price. I love it. I don't like confrontational negotiation. Honestly, I don't like having to over-exaggerate and lie about how much I think it's going to cost to repair the house. And there's a lot of guys out there teaching traditional wholesaling and will teach you when you're meeting with the seller to over-exaggerate how bad the house looks and to say, man, that roof's going to cost me $5,000 to fix. When you know you can do it for $2,500, okay? Now, not, you know, Sometimes there's a place for that because you need to make sure that you leave room for profit for yourself. But um, anyway, lease options, I love it because it allows you to control property without owning it.